Welcome to this lecture on transplant immunology, which forms part of the transplant online course for the Global Kidney Academy. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to recognize that lymphocytes are the main effector cells in the rejection process and understand why lymphocyte C allogenate tissue as so foreign. You should appreciate the central role of a CD4 positive T cell and how it becomes activated and then how it interacts with other cells in the immune system. You should have a good understanding of the effector response that leads to graft rejection and the relationship between these processes and the action of immunosuppressive drugs. The first successful human transplant was carried out in Boston in 1954 between identical twins. Previous transplants had been carried out in the 1930s and 40s but all had failed due to severe unstoppable rejection. And when scientists looked at the kidneys that had been removed from these patients who had lost grafts due to rejection, they found that there was a heavy infiltrate of lymphocytes shown here as these dark cells in the renal interstitium. It was also in the 1950s that a famous experiment was carried out by Sir Peter Medivoire establishing lymphocytes as the main effector cells in transplant rejection. In his now famous experiment he took skin grafts between two genetically different strains of mice. When the two mouse mice were from the same strain then there was no rejection of the skin graft. However if a skin graft from one type of mouse was put onto a second type of mouse then the graft was rejected within 10 days. If the experiment was repeated with a second graft, then on this occasion the skin graft was rejected in only six days in what he termed as a second set rejection process. Perhaps more importantly, if he then took lymphocytes from the spleen of the animal that had already rejected a graft and injected them into a naive mouse, that is a mouse that had never previously had a skin graft, it then rejected a foreign skin graft in six days. This was also a second set rejection and showed that the immunological memory and accelerated response could be transferred by lymphocytes. So they had shown at this stage that graft rejection was dependent on lymphocytes and it was later proved that CD4 positive T helper cells were the main cell type involved in this process. This led to the rationale for treatment which was to use drugs known to be effective at killing lymphocytes such as those used in lymphoma and other treatments such as total body irradiation. They had also proven the existence of an accelerated memory response when a second graft was transplanted from a similar individual and they had shown that the graft rejection was strongest when pairs were non-identical and transplants between pairs that are not identical are called allogeneic transplants. Experiments in the 1960s showed that these lymphocytes were being stimulated by HLA molecules. There are two main types of HLA molecule, class 1 molecules which consist of a heavy chain and beta 2 microglobulin. These are present on all nucleated blood cells. Importantly they are not present on red blood cells. Class 2 HLA molecules consist of two different dimers, an alpha and a beta protein and these are present mainly on antigen presenting cells but also some other cells. Later studies showed that the real role of these HLA molecules was to present peptides as part of the normal immune process. In fact HLA molecules are very poly polymorphic. 
This means that there is a lot of genetic variation between individuals, particularly in the areas shown here on the upward facing helices and in the groove area where peptides are normally bound. The normal function of these molecules is to sit on the surface of antigen presenting cells and present foreign peptides to CD4 T cells such as in infections with viruses or with tumours. If you try to imagine what a normal self antigen presenting cell looks like it would be akin to the diagram on the left hand side where most of the molecules are relatively normal looking shown here by representation in white but occasionally some of these molecules on the cell surface are presenting foreign peptides if the cell has been infected by a virus or has become neoplastic. In contrast an allogeneic cell from a disparate individual will look very different. Firstly, the upward facing residues of the HLA molecule will look different and secondly because of the variation in the structure of the peptide binding groove the peptides bound to foreign HLA molecules will also be very different. This means that to a T cell the target looks very different with some highly immunogenic molecules peppered over the surface of an allogeneic cell. We all inherit different HLA molecules from our parents as shown in this example. If you look at the mother here she may have one type of HLA molecule and I've given three different HLA molecules here an A, an HLA B molecule and an HLA DR molecule and then to each of her offspring she will give half of them one type and half of them the other type. This complete type is called a haplotype. The father will also have two different types of HLA molecule and will give half of the offspring one type and half the other type. This means that amongst siblings the chances of having exactly the same haplotypes are approximately one in four. It is for this reason that a one in four siblings are haplotype identical in living donor transplantation. So the allo response, that is the immune response to allogeneic molecules, is dependent on CD4 T cells recognizing the HLA molecules. And the CD4 T cell then becomes activated and clonally proliferates, expanding to form many copies of the same cell. Foreign HLA molecules are innately different because of the different genetic makeup between individuals and look very different on the surface of cells because they bind different peptides. To explain this further it's best to consider a human kidney transplant between two genetically disparate individuals. In this example we have a donor of one type represented in orange donating a kidney to an individual of another type here represented in blue. the donor kidney from the gentleman in orange will be packed full of leukocytes, comma, antigen presenting cells of his own type so that when the graft is implanted into the other gentleman the antigen presenting cells will immediately track to the draining lymph nodes in the groin where they will encounter lymphocytes of the other type shown here for blue lymphocytes with orange antigen presenting cells. The interaction between the host T cell shown in blue and the donor antigen presenting cell is critical 
and forms the cornerstone of the allergenic immune response. This interaction between the cells is often called the immunological synapse and is shown here in diagrammatic form and also in a molecular string diagram on the left hand side. Central to this process is the interaction here between the T-cell receptor and the foreign HLA molecule with its bound peptide on the donor antigen presenting cell. This is known as signal 1 and initiates the interaction between the two cell types. However, the interaction also depends on other important groups of molecules. Here we show the interaction between co-stimulatory molecules, CD40 ligand on the T cell and CD40 on the antigen presenting cell, and also another group of CD28 or CTLA4 on the T cell and the B7 group of molecules on the antigen presenting cells. It is signaling from these sets of molecules that forms what we call signal 2. Full interaction between the two cells also involves other groups of cells. Particularly important is signaling through cytokines such as interleukin 2, but also other cytokines that may modulate the response. More recently it has been found that this interaction may be modulated by cells from the complement pathway because of receptors on both the T cells and the antigen presenting cells and also particles from cells such as DNA and RNA that are released in the injury response may affect the interaction. In summary the interaction between the T cell and the foreign antigen presenting cell has three parts activation through the T cell receptor then a second signal delivered by the co-stimulatory molecules and then a third signal delivered by soluble molecules onto receptors. When the T cell is activated it pro produces interleukin 2 and this molecule is critical to the activation of T cells. When a T cell becomes activated it also not only generates interleukin 2 but also the alpha chain of the interleukin-2 receptor shown here. This is a very important molecule as it increases the affinity for interleukin-2 and creates a positive feedback loop. This is important later on because one of the monoclonal antibodies that is used in preventing rejection targets this molecule CD25 as it is also known. So the interaction of a CD4 positive T cell is dependent on the interaction between the T cell receptor and the foreign HLA molecule. But this interaction is also modulated by co-stimulatory molecules, the secretion of cytokines, in particular IL-2, but also other proteins in the immediate environment such as complement and products of tissue damage such as DNA and RNA. This activation could be shown in the following diagram where the allergenic cell from the orange gentleman has been recognised by the T cells from the blue gentleman resulting in activation. As shown here the generation of IL-2 is critical in this response and IL-2 secretion in both an autocrine and paracrine matter, manner leads to activation of a CD4 T cell. This cell then enters cell cycle generating many copies of the reactive clone of T-cell and these T-cells then go on to induce other parts of the immune resistor system in the effector response which is shown in the next few slides. The molecular basis for the activation of T-cells involves initially the interaction between the T-cell receptor and the MHC molecule. This then activates a number of intracellular pathways within the T-cell. One of the most important of these is the activation of calcineurin shown here. Calcineurin is a phosphatase that removes phosphates from NFAT nuclear factor of activated T-cells. When this transcription factor is dephosphorylated, 
NFAT migrates to the cell nucleus and initiates the transcription of many genes, but in particular the IL-2 gene. If you inhibit calcineurin, which can be done with either tacrolimus or cyclosporin, then this process is markedly reduced. Interactions between co-stimulatory molecules lead to protection from passive cell death and also activation of TOR proteins. These TOR proteins are important because they can be inhibited by molecules such as serolimus. Also important in cell survival is the interaction with interleukin-2. Eventually the cell will go into cell cycle to proliferate. It's important to have a basic understanding of these processes to understand the molecules that form modern immunosuppression as shown in this diagram and alluded to in one of your references. The interaction between the T cell and the antigen presenting cell at the T cell receptor can be affected by molecules such as anti-CD3. Signaling to the nucleus can be affected by cyclosporin and tacrolimus. Molecules such as balatacept can affect the interaction of co-stimulatory molecules and then the, the anti-CD25 molecules such as basiliximab can affect the interaction with interleukin-2 with the high affinity interleukin-2 receptor and then there are also interactions that are affected by molecules such as serolimus with the molecule mTOR and the anti-proliferative agents which affect the provision of nucleotides for the cell cycling. Once activated, the CD4 T cell here interacts with B cells within the lymph node to form antibodies that are reactive for molecules from the orange individual. It also induces cytotoxic CD8 T cells which go round and back to the graft looking for foreign proteins and when it finds foreign HLA molecules on the surface of cells it destroys them. CD4 T cells can also set up delayed type hypersensitivity reactions leading to the influx of other cells such as macrophages and causing tissue damage. This process forms the efferent phase of the response whereby the cells and the effector molecules migrate back from the lymphocyte, lymph node through the bloodstream and back into the transplant. Here lymphocytes look for cells expressing foreign HLA molecules and alloreactive antibodies also look for these molecules. Lymphocytes home back to the graft. Normally lymphocytes roll along the surface of cells becoming activating then sticking to the cell surface and migrating into the tissue. In tissues where there are activated cells and inflammation there may be molecules expressed such as VCAM1 which lead to enhanced adhesion of affected T cells and a rapid influx of these inflammatory cells. For CD4 cells the type of reaction that they produce often depends on the environment in which they are produced. For example if a CD4 T cell becomes activated in the presence of interleukin-12 then it will often form a Th1 type T cell which will go back to the transplant and set up inflammation leading to rejection process. CD4 T cells can also form Th17 type cells which are also instrumental in the rejection process. Sometimes however CD4 T cells, if they become activated in the right environment, can actually form cells that modulate the rejection response, so-called T regulatory cells. CD8 T cells will home back to the graft where they will interact with adhesion molecules and infiltrate the tissue, seeking out the foreign molecules on the surface of cells. This is shown in this diagram on the right with cytotoxic lymphocytes homing 
into the blood vessels around the T cells, uh, sorry, around the tubular cells of the transplant and infiltrating the cells. And if cytotoxic T cells discover allergenic MHC molecules, then they will cause these cells to be destroyed. This is the process that is thought to underlie tubulitis in the transplant. Another important effector molecule is the antibody produced by B cells. These cells circulate in the blood and look for proteins on the surface of endothelial cells within the graft. Antibodies can lead to a number of outcomes and perhaps the classical effector response is for the antibody to bind to its target and then activate complement and this results in lysis of the cells. However, antibodies can also recruit activated, can recruit leukocytes via their FC gamma receptors and they can activate the clotting pathway via a number of effects including the loss of tissue factor, the activation of platelets and the coagulation pathways. Important antibodies in the rejection process include preformed antibodies such as blood group antibodies, antibodies that we naturally possess against animal proteins such as xenogenic antibodies and also antibodies against HLA molecules that we naturally acquire during processes such as blood transfusion, pregnancy and transplantation itself. After transplantation, recipients of renal transplant may develop de novo antibodies such as those against HLA molecules, endothelial cells, the angiotensin II receptor or vimentin and all of these may lead to chronic antibody mediated rejection or acute antibody mediated rejection. I hope this process is clear and some of these principles will be discussed in later lectures on the processes of tissue typing and types of rejection that occur in kidney transplants.